Welcome, Tracy. And uh, uh, we look forward to what you have to say. Good evening, Mahag. Uh, and thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak here this evening. Uh, on the morning of Wednesday, the second day of September, the grave in Los Angeles Cemetery was opened in the presence of Mr. Lawrence Branick and several other friends of Father O'Growney. Upon opening the grave, said Mr. Branick, we found the wooden coffin in which he was interred, dry, but the nails were rusty, so that it was easy to take apart. We found him in the same calm repose as when we saw him last, with his hands folded on his breast and between his fingers the beads and crucifix which were placed there by Sister Angela. The body was in a fair state of preservation and the full beard still covered the face, whilst the purple vestments in which we robed him were but slightly discoloured. After lifting the coffin out of the grave, we took away all of the old coffin, except the board on which the figure lay. Then, without moving a hair on his head or disturbing his rest, we placed the board inside the new casket, which was draped with lace and satin, and it was then sealed and prepared for the long trip of 7,000 miles to Maynooth College. And thus began the final journey of Antahar Ono Grauni. But before we take a closer look at that journey, I would like to take a minute to introduce Owen O'Growney to anyone unfamiliar with him or with his legacy. Owen, or Eugene O'Growney, was born in Ballyfallon at Bowie County Meath on the 24th of September, 1863, to Seamus Growney and his wife, Margaret Smith, from Kilskeer. Seamus's father, Owen, worked on the estate of Abraham Coles in Ballyfallon, a role which Seamus himself subsequently inherited. On marrying Margaret, they moved into a cottage in Cole's estate, and it was here that their son Owen was born. He was one of five children, two girls, Molly and sister Veronica, and three boys, Christor, Podrig, and Owen. Seamus became a steward on additional land of Coles, about a mile from Ballyfallon in Drishogue, a role which resulted in regular absences from home, as he traveled to marts and fairs, often in the west of Ireland. Margaret, as a result, was the main influencer in her children's lives, and it is thought that it was from her that Owen got his thoughtful traits, along with her interest in the Irish way of life. In 1868, Owen began his formal schooling in Atboy. It is important to note here that the Irish language played no role in O'Growney's national schooling, nor could it be claimed that his schooling played any role in his later fluency in the language. The place of Irish in the school curriculum was an issue in which O'Growney himself came to feel strongly, and he believed that the schools had a significant role to play in its preservation. He was about 14 years of age before he encountered the Irish language, when he happened to be greeted by one of his father's workers in a language alien to him. When informed by another man present that the greeting was in Irish, he thought that they were mocking him but he discovered soon after that there were books available in it and people who could speak it. Thus began in earnest a journey of discovery, of learning and of love for the native language of his country. In an article in Unsogart in 1963, a commemorative edition to mark 100 years since O'Growney's birth, Antahar Sean McCarty referred to the early part of O'Growney's life as follows. Shud is good rug away if we score tower nuri. Vi skull no shunta no hov we foggy egge, nor a hig shade and shade oars could have tonga ella all our tenieren, shakas and socks verla. Nor a hastigoig tillid and tonga shot a floss so guinea a togul guige, for shamak could have noira or who are oddwall could have shiaku, and as bashtak low and stoke up masul shot of a co more a stray is a roger of fun air and guige a owlum. And just to translate, even though he was born in the shadow of Tara, he had left the national school in that boy before he realised that there was another language being spoken in Ireland other than English. When he wanted to hear more of this language being spoken by those raised with it, he found that they were embarrassed to admit that they spoke it. And they found it strange that this respectful young man was so much astray as to want to learn Irish. Common Boon Chosantan Agaige, or the Society for the Preservation of the Irish Language, was established in 1876. They brought out a number of books for beginners, and it was through these publications and interactions with some enthusiastic neighbours that O'Growney began to learn Irish. By the time he was in St Finian's College Junior Seminary in Navan, he had built up a relationship with Nanny Shields, an Irish speaker from the locality. 
He would often call to her on his way home from school and listen to her speak. As his fluency increased and his interactions with the language became more frequent, his enthusiasm for it grew. He was now convinced that the language was the very soul of the country and that the people of Ireland needed to understand that the Irish identity would be lost if the language and all that was preserved in her was allowed to die. During O'Brownie's final year in St Finian's College in Navan, he began to suffer with ill health. Having finished his secondary schooling in Navan and having been accepted to the study of the priesthood, he entered the seminary in Maynooth on the 1st of September 1882. Almost immediately, he struck up a friendship with Peter York, who would remain a firm friend to the very end and who would play a role in the repatriation of the Atboy natives' remains. Over the years in Maynooth, O'Brownie got more and more absorbed in the language, actively encouraging his fellow students to get involved and taking advantage of any opportunity to practice it in its various dialects. It was while he was in Maynooth that he discovered there were students there with him from areas in the country in which the Irish language was still spoken, which led him to spend summer after summer in Gwaithtoft regions, increasing his fluency and understanding of the language. For him, mastering his native language and prioritising its preservation became even more important than his clerical studies. Donica O'Flein, who was Professor of Irish in Maynooth from 1942 to 64, was among those who published articles in the 1963 edition of Irish Lower Juan Nude, and in it he summarises what he perceived to be O'Brownie's goals. Davidishin is Fader Rog or Hogan Tahir Own and Belgan Blina Dog Dia Satelega, a Shrustal for Yaho Spirok. Tarhal and Dukish, Agas Moonun at Sangan, is Ocker Conan Dukish. Vi bwynsig yn dos spirok lichiela, ac ni flor no fi ysega gyr fiogan fri an tanga de fe yn meil yn ffobl, da mach yn dwcus y fwyn lehi bosaha. It can be said, therefore, that Father Owen spent the few years that God gave him in his life striving for two goals, rescuing the country's heritage and teaching the language that is key to that heritage. Both goals were intertwined and he recognised there was little use in people speaking the language if the heritage to which it belonged was dead. At this time, the Irish language was not respected in Maynooth by the authorities. It was the enthusiasm of students like O'Growney that ensured its very existence within the walls of the college. But support for the language was growing nationally, and O'Growney looked to strengthen his connections with the language movement outside the college walls. To that end, he travelled relatively regularly to Dublin and maintained correspondence with anyone that wanted to communicate in Irish with him. Una ni Arcula, author of Laura and Her Own, the most comprehensive work we have on him, tells us, His correspondence at this time was immense and varied. Celtologists from the continent and fisher folk from Inishman, young priests in Irish-speaking districts and Irish men and women in foreign countries eager to join in the work at home, all wrote to him for advice or assistance and all were sure of a prompt and helpful reply. He wrote to every corner of the world on behalf of the language, and his personality, felt even in his letters, was a potent influence in welding together the ever-increasing number of those interested in the Young League. It was at this time, too, that he began to publish Irish language material. After taking a year away from the college to look after his health, he returned to Maynooth and was ordained to the priesthood in June 1889. He spent the next two years in Mullingar and Balnacarrigi, and it was during this time that he began correspondence with Douglas Hyde on all aspects of the language, literature and culture of Ireland. In 1891, O'Brownie was elected a member of the Gaelic Union. He became editor of Irish Lower na Gaelge and was appointed Professor of Irish in Maynooth, a chair that had laid empty for 16 years. Two years later, in 1893, he began publishing his simple lessons in Irish in the weekly Free Freeman, these lessons would later be published. Uh, these lessons would later be published as a series of booklets and used across the country in branches of Conran na Gaeilge, which would be established that same year with O'Brownie actively involved in it from the start. But just as things appeared to be taking off, both for the language movement and for O'Brownie himself, his poor health became a factor in his ability to carry out his various duties. In June 1894, he was forced to hand over the editorship of Irish Lauer na Gaeilge to Conra na Gaeilge and requested a leave of absence from the authorities in Maynooth. 
In consultation with his doctors, he decided to go to California, where he hoped the air would be better suited to him. And on the 8th of November, 1894, Ono Growney bid farewell to his native land and left Queenstown, now Cove, for California on board the Teutonic. We will never know for sure whether or not he knew that this would be the last time he would set a living foot on the soil of Ireland. But the next time he would arrive into Cove, the quiet circumstances of his departure would be in stark contrast, contrast to the celebrated return of his remains. On arrival in America, he remained in San Francisco until January 1895, but ill health drove him further south and to Tucson, Arizona. All the while, he continued with his simple lessons, which were growing increasingly popular, and he maintained his various correspondences, eager to keep appraised of developments at home. But he was forced to spend increasingly more time in a sanatorium in the mountains of Arizona and move fully to that area in May. July of the following year, 1896, O'Growney resigned his chair in Maynooth. Over the next couple of years, his spirits were lifted by visits from friends, among them Lawrence Brannock, who had been in Maynooth with him. By the second half of 1899, his health had deteriorated greatly, forcing him to leave Arizona and to go to Los Angeles and to the Mercy Hospital. Whilst there, he was forced to undergo a series of operations to remove fluid from his lungs, before having a tube inserted to that end on the 10th of October. Just under three weeks prior to this, on the 23rd of September, 1899, Antahar Ono Growney had said his last mass. On the 17th of October, aware of his impending death, he wrote to his sister, Sister Veronica. I had to undergo a necessary operation, which seemed at first to be successful, but the shock to my worn out system has been too great. And I have now probably only a few hours to remain in this world. I am quite contented and happy, and I know that you and all my friends will not forget me in your prayers. Ono Growney, son of Ballyfallon at Boy County Meath, died the following evening, Wednesday the 18th of October, during the Angelus Bell, aged just 36. One of the sisters at the hospital wrote thus of his death. The struggle was maintained till the Angelus last evening, during which he passed away. A few minutes before six o'clock, a young priest who had been staying with him took his leave to go to supper, when Father O'Growney, rousing himself, said to him, No one should despair of the mercy of God, even at the last moment. I am so indescribably happy that I cannot express it. Five minutes later, he was dead. He never lost consciousness up to the last breath, nor the serenity of manner and countenance that has made his death altogether exceptional in the history of the hospital and which has had a most salutary and even sanctifying effect on the physicians who attended him. Lawrence Branock, a Growney's good friend, sent telegrams to Dublin and to Maynooth with word of his death and the news spread quickly among the branches of the League as throughout the country, Irish men, women and children were consumed by grief at the passing of a figure who had done so much to ignite in them a passion for what was their own. In Maynooth, Michal O'Hickey, O'Growney's successor to the Irish chair, delivered a heartfelt lecture on the 21st of October. To very many in Ireland, as well as many, very many of the scattered members of our race, no sadder or more heartbreaking news has come for many a day than the announcement of the death of Father O'Growney, which three days ago flashed along the wires from the distant Pacific Slope. Far away from his cradle land, from the land which claimed his undivided affection, has he fallen asleep in death. Far away from that land to which he gave such loyal and ungrudging service, for whose glory and renown he ceaselessly laboured, on behalf of whose ancient language and literature he spent himself during his all too brief span of mortal existence, must his bones repose, must all that was mortal of him await the resurrection. Thousands of miles away from his natal spot in Royal Meath, his remains have ere now been consigned to the silence of the tomb. But if gratitude and patriotism have not wholly died out of the Irish heart, his name and memory must permanently endure in Erin. After Requiem Mass in the Cathedral in Los Angeles, Ono Growney was buried in Calvary Cemetery, 
in a section known as the Priest's Plot, looking out to sea, his head towards Ireland. A sloping lawn it was, and not too wide, the very spot he would have loved if it were an Irish earth. They laid him down some miles from the rush of the town, and Irish men and women will remember the generosity of Bishop Montgomery and the priests of this southern diocese in giving a grave to the priest from Ireland who died amongst them. According to the account in Una Niarchula's Lauer and Atter Own, O'Growney's funeral was reasonably well attended, with both Irish and foreign priests present, along with a number of laity. It was orderly and decent, we read in the account, but there were not many tears, for we have not much heart left in this sad world for utter strangers. Yet it was a beautiful grave in a fair sunny place where the soil was dry and warm, and they had lined it round with greenest boughs and then the scattered flowers over our soggart, and Ireland thanks them for it. It was noted in the description of the funeral published in Clive Sullish on the 19th of November 1899 that six members of the ancient order of Hibernians were the pallbearers. References like those of O'Hickey's above to a Growney far away from his cradle land, from the land to which he gave such loyal and ungrudging service, to his being thousands of miles away from his natal spot, were echoed in speeches, in sermons, at meetings and in discussions among Gaelic leaguers everywhere. People began to wonder if O'Growney had wished to be buried in Ireland, if O'Growney should have been buried in Ireland. It was firmly believed that his final wish would not have been to be buried in exile away from his home. When asked by Brannock before he died where he would be buried, O'Growney reportedly replied, I'll be buried here. On hearing this, it was assumed that this was an indication of his preference rather than a practical answer to the question posed. And interest in the issue of whether or not he should be buried in Ireland diminished, for a while at least. It was Brannock himself who rekindled the idea in a letter he wrote to the editor of the Irish World in November 1899, a letter subsequently copied into Irish newspapers. Before his death, I asked him about many things in case he should die which was a rather delicate subject to speak on. He said he will be buried here. I felt sure, however, that his wish was that he be buried in Ireland and that his reason for saying this was that he had no means left to provide for the sending of his body to Ireland. Owing to his great humility, he would not even think that his remains would be sent home by his loving countrymen. One evening, a few weeks before his death, as we were talking on some Gaelic matter, he suddenly said, I wish I could go to Ireland, meaning if he had strength enough. I thought then his long for visit would be in the interest of the language he loved so well. Now, however, I think it may be the yearning of his heart to be once again back in faraway Ireland so that his bones might rest in our virgin soil. He concluded this letter with a call to the Irish to bring the Brownie home. Irishmen, it is our sacred duty to bring to Holy Ireland, the land for whose honour and language he martyred his young life, the precious bones of Father O'Growney, whose memory, as long as Gaelic lives, will never be forgotten at the Irish fireside, or at the fair or market, on mountain or moor. Granick's call did not go unnoticed. In Dublin, the following was published in Fáinne and Lay. No Irish exile has yet found a country so fair that its delights could blot out the recollections of the little island of tears. His heart has never found joy so great that it would not leap with fresh delight at the assurance your resurrection shall be in Ireland. Perhaps it does not matter where a man's bones may happen to lie, but we are hopelessly old fashioned on this point. Few Irish men or Irish women would be ready to believe that Father O'Growney had any desire to rest in faraway California. To him, as to myriads of his people, the resting place was one of necessity and not of choice. It would be a great tribute to his services to take home the mortal remains of one who had served his nation so well. The question is one which should not require to be flogged into the thoughts of his fellow countrymen. The challenge was accepted by the Irish in America, and at a meeting of the Gaelic League in Chicago in August 1901, the decision was taken to start a fund with the view to repatriating the remains 
and a plan was put in place. By October 1902, Peter York, having been elected president of the Californian branch of the League, along with three other senior leaguers, were tasked with making arrangements for the exhumation and transferal of O'Growney's remains to Ireland. Peter York was unable to travel to Ireland, however, but he fittingly appointed Lawrence Bidanek to take his place. After much discussion between the League in America and the executive branch in Ireland, it was decided that Ono Growney should be laid to rest in Maynooth. As noted at the start of the seminar, on Wednesday, the 2nd of September, 1903, the grave in Los Angeles was opened and the long journey home for the young priest from Ballyfallon began. Following the exhumation, his remains were taken to St. Viviana's Cathedral in Los Angeles and placed before the altar where Manny paid their respects. A funeral mass was celebrated by Father Hartnett, Vicar General of the, the Diocese of Monterey and Los Angeles, at which he was assisted by numerous members of the clergy. Lawrence Bidanek and officers of the local Gaelic League were the chief mourners, and among the pallbearers were members of the Ancient Order of Hibernians, the Knights of Columbus and the Knights of Robert Emmett. His remains lay in state here for a day and two nights before they travelled to San Francisco, escorted by Branach, who would remain by his good friend's side until he was safely back in Maynooth. Having travelled a thousand miles from Los Angeles, Branach and the remains arrived in San Francisco on Sunday the 6th of September, where they were met by Father York. The previous day, the following account had appeared in the leader newspaper in San Francisco, as the Irish there waited for their arrival of the remains. It will be a solemn spectacle, this long funeral, starting from the busy city of Los Angeles and ending in the little cemetery by the quiet cloisters of Maynooth. Under those elms, many a time he sat and meditated on the things of eternity. There he had hoped to be buried. Now from the uttermost shores, the kindly Irish of the Irish will bear him over land and sea and lay him to rest among his own people. In restoring to the mother country the bones of Ono Growney, the Irish of California are performing a duty of piety and patriotism. These relics are too precious to lie on a foreign shore. They belong to Ireland. He was a young man when he died. He was never a strong man. He was not a brilliant speaker and abhorred public life, but quietly, persistently, indefatigably, he did such work for Ireland as no man had ever done. Having arrived in San Francisco, the remains lay in state in the Hall of the Red Branch Knights for almost a week, flanked by a guard of honour from Company A of the Irish Volunteers, while throngs paid their respects. The evening before the funeral mass, the Office for the Dead was chanted in the hall in the presence of a huge crowd, the majority of whom responded passionately to the prayers recited in Irish. The following day, his remains were brought through Lyne streets to a crowded St Mary's Cathedral for the celebration of the second funeral mass since the remains were disinterred and the third since O'Growney's death. Again, numerous members of the clergy took part in the ceremony and representatives of many groups and bodies were among the mourners, including the Gaelic League of California, the Ancient Order of Hibernians, the St Patrick's Day Convention, the O'Growney branch of the Gaelic League in California, the Knights of St. Patrick, the Gaelic Dancing Club of the Gaelic League, and the Knights of Tara. The large cathedral was reportedly packed, and it was noted that there was scarcely standing room, so dense was the crowd. Archbishop Reardon was chief celebrant, Lawrence Bidanek delivered the sermon, and Peter York the eulogy. And the following is an excerpt from Father York's oration. We come today to pay such honour to the memory of Eugene O'Growney as is paid to few men. After a lapse of four years, we take up his remains and carry them over land and sea that they may lie in peace among the dead of his own nation. Men may ask why the signal honour should be shown on O'Growney. His very name is unknown among them. He was a young man when he died. His paths lay not in the glare of publicity, he was a student, a scholar, yet thousands and ten, tens of thousands are watching this funeral today with wet eyes and are saying from sad hearts, Banach de Lena Anam, the blessing of God on his soul.
The answer to this question as to why he was being honoured thus is found in the life work of Father O'Browney. In a short time, he achieved much and his achievements remain. His career was short, but it was like the blast of a trumpet among the hills. After the love of God comes the love of country. That man must indeed be insensible to human emotions whose heart does not beat faster at the thought of his native land. More than any other people, the Irish have felt the heart smart of exile. In that casket lies the dust that once was the heart of him who heard through the centuries the call of the Gael and bravely set his face to follow in the paths worn by the saints and scholars of Mother Aidan. Eugene O'Growney saw and was able to make others see that the whole existence of the Irish race is bound up with the Irish language. A language is the soul of a people, and when a language dies, the soul of the people dies with it. He understood that to let the old language go was to betray the cause of nationality. After the funeral, the coffin was taken from the church, flanked by the League of the Cross Cadets, Gaelic Leaguers, members of the Ancient Order of Hibernians, the Ladies Auxiliary, the Knights of the Red Branch, the St. Patrick's Alliance, the Knights of St. Patrick and the Celtic Union. Bidanic and the remains bid farewell to San Francisco and journeyed on to Chicago. On arrival in Chicago, they were escorted to the church for the third funeral mass of the journey, the fourth in total. The eulogy was delivered on this occasion by Reverend Thomas Judge, who had been Professor of Logic and Mental Philosophy in Maynooth when O'Growney held the Irish chair. As York had done in San Francisco, Judge too spoke of O'Growney's appeal to the Irish people and his love of land and language. What was the secret of the charm? The fascination and the magnetic influence that O'Growney exercised on Irish men the world over. It lay in the fact that he was a Celt in every fibre of his being. He surrendered himself, heart, mind and conscience, to Irish sentiments, ideas and principles. Love of the old land took up the harp of his life and smote all its chords. Another funeral over, another leg of the journey complete, the remains made their onward passage to New York, where the Irish there were waiting excitedly for their turn to honour the precious cargo. A committee had been formed from the various Irish societies in the city to ensure that O'Growney's remains would be given an even greater reception than they had received in Los Angeles, San Francisco and Chicago. The following address was issued by the committee the week before their arrival. <clears throat> to the Irish residents of New York, the remains of Father Eugene O'Growney, the eminent Gaelic scholar and author of Easy Lessons in Irish, will arrive in this city on their way for final interment in Irish soil on Thursday evening. Here, the last honours which the Irish race in the Empire City can pay in reference to his memory will be given. The casket will have passed from its temporary resting place in Los Angeles to San Francisco, where all honours that loving Irish hearts can contribute will have been given. Chicago also will have paid its tribute of respect to his remains by magnificent outpourings. It remains for New York to equal, if not outrival, these centres of the Pacific Coast and the Middle West in demonstrating their love and respect for the memory of one who in the very prime of manhood gave up his young life that the Irish home might live. Father O'Growney's motto when living was for the glory of God and the honour of Aidan. For this he laboured, for this he died. Let his countrymen in New York adopt his motto this motto, and show by their presence on this occasion an appreciation of and testimony to his services. Such lofty motives should inspire all his countrymen to honour his memory, and we call upon them by their presence and active cooperation to make this final demonstration a fitting farewell from the land of his adoption to the land waiting to clasp him once more to its breast. The remains arrived into Grand Central Station on the 17th of September, where they were met by representatives of the Irish societies, by O'Growney's brother, Chris Dore, and by Major O'Donovan, president of the Gaelic League in America. From the station, the cortege made its way to St. Patrick's Cathedral, where prayers were said. The funeral mass was celebrated the next morning, and Father Kniff, an Irish redemptorist in Manhattan, delivered the funeral oration in Irish, followed by a short summary in English. Throughout the afternoon, thousands came to the cathedral to pay their respects 
and to bid farewell to O'Brownie, who was about to depart the shores of America and to sail homewards across the Atlantic Ocean. A ship belonging to the Cunard Company, called the Campania, was the vessel in which the remains would make this part of the journey. Having hoped to give O'Brownie a memorable send-off, the Irish of New York were informed by the shipping company that they could not come to the dock as they did not wish to draw attention to the presence of a coffin on board. Just four men stood in the docks on departure day as a result. The four men who would accompany the remains home. Lawrence Bidanek, Father Fielding who had come with Bidanek from Chicago, Major O'Donovan and Chris Dore O'Growney. The disappointment in the city was keen, Unani Arkila tells us when it became known that the officials of the Cunard Company notified the local committee in charge of the arrangements that the body would not be taken on board if there were any demonstration which would draw the attention of passengers to the fact that there was to be a coffin on the ship. All the arrangements having been already made to travel by the Campania, there was nothing for it but to yield. So the casket within its oaken cover was silently taken from the cathedral and placed within the great liner. Then the four pallbearers took their place of honour and trust preparatory to the long voyage. Everything had pointed to a great send off from the eastern shore, but it was not to be. And quietly, Eugene O'Growney left the busy city where nine years before he had landed unnoticed in the crowd. The sea crossing just took just under a week. And as the liner moved within 300 miles of the Irish coast, the men charged with the remains sent the following message to those waiting in Cove. O'Growney is nearing the land of his love. Just as it happened in New York, preparations to receive his remains had been underway in Ireland since the decision was taken to bring them home. And a subcommittee of the Gaelic League was formed to work with Daniel Mannix, the then vice president, soon to be president of Maynooth, and with relevant parties in Cove and Dublin. A meeting was held on the Wednesday evening, two days before the remains would arrive, to finalise arrangements and to ensure that in Cove, Dublin and Maynooth, crowds would gather as they had done across America to welcome O'Growney home. It was noted at the meeting that arrangements for the transport of the remains from Dublin's Broadstone station to Maynooth would be published in Saturday's papers, and the suggestion was approved to request that all licensed premises and clubs in Dublin should keep their doors closed until about 4 p.m. on Sunday in order to aid in the proper carrying out of the funeral procession and to enable the assistance in those houses to take part in the solemnities. On its arrival into Cove on Friday the 25th of September 1903, five delegates from the Central Executive Committee of the Gaelic League boarded the Campania. Douglas Hyde, President, Owen McNeil as Vice President, Patrick O'Daly, General Secretary, Edward Martin, a board member, and Una Niarchila, also board member and author of Lauer on Aher Owen. For a long time, wrote Niarchila, we waited down by the quay. At last, about two o'clock, the Campania was signalled off the old head of Kinsale, and before long we were all on board the Ireland, a special tender generously given by the Cunard Company as a mark of respect to the dead. It was a day that filled one with the joy of living, yet our mission was one of death. We crossed the bay with the flag flying at half mast and made for the open sea, leaving the bay some miles behind. As yet, the Campania was not in sight, so the little vessel lay for some time, poised on the big waves of the Atlantic. At length, the huge liner was seen as a speck on the horizon. Then her two funnels became distinct, and soon her whole outline appeared bearing rapidly down upon us, her decks crowded with passengers of every nationality, a groundy coming to his own. One would not miss that moment for worlds. Closer and closer the great vessel came, then slowing up, she stood out seaward. We were soon on board the Campania to welcome our American friends and receive the sacred charge. It was a time indescribable in its mingled feelings, but ever present was the pride and the sadness of our Sogart's return. There in the midst of all was the casket in its massive case of oak clasped in copper, and with bated breath we watched them move it into the tender. The little vessel was set free again, 
and the waters began to rise between us and the Campania, and it became but a memory and as a vague dream. The reality for us was centred in the great coffin beside us, and as we kissed the sacred wood, the shrine of our patriot priest, we gave a warm Irish welcome to the poor cold clay that could no more return the greeting. Three hours we were abroad on the water that September day, and as we neared the shore, returning, the crowd thickened on the deep water quay. On reaching land, the coffin was removed from its outer casket and it was placed on an open hearse, which took it in the direction of the cathedral. Later that evening, a special service was held at which Father Peter O'Leary and Tahir Padrit delivered the oration. Una Niarchila gives the following description of the anticipation felt by those present as on Tahir Padrit rose to speak. Then from the choir, on Tahir Pather came forward in his white surplice, Beretta in hand, and passing the altar rails, walked down the aisle towards the pulpit. We held our breath. On Tahir Pather, the magician of words, the weaver of idiom that flashes on our consciousness and half-forgotten memories that have come to us from the dead and gone of our race. On Tahir Pather, who stirs up ways of thinking that were dormant from the time of our grandfathers, a remembering of vanished things that were in our blood as part of our being and we knew not. No wonder we were moved. He then began his oration as follows. <laughs> Con an order hurt the haggard wa. Is cart an order hurt do, mar beaker guarded the hail, the yencha uber war wa. Near the way till day sail father hurt do, near hogu do har latin heimstress gno a hurt than dinner it in sail show. Aksamed einshida forche, yencha uber the ha co more, co ma, co raw for co tarifak, agas a gahakshin a kerifiki bean ga hurkuntashka, ga gain law yev, the ligant uig. A vrishin shahatomit klinaha and sahanot, ilohar nakoran son, konahanoda is dul do a horto kri, dun tagart wa, guilla knova shinta is stiginti. Agasas berle, my dear friends, we are all gathered here tonight. For what? To pay homage to a great priest. It is a right it is right to honour him, for even though his life was short, he did great work. It was not God's will that he would live long. He was given but half the time a person normally gets in this life. But in the time he was given, his achievements were as great as had he had been given 80 years and not been a day idle. This is why we are gathered here tonight in the presence of this coffin to pay true homage from the heart to the good priest whose bones lie therein. And Tahar Pather concluded by thanking all those who had been involved in the exhumation and delivery of O'Grownie's remains to Ireland but reminded them of the futility of their efforts if the cause of the Irish language and the legacy of O'Grownie were forgotten. Sir Scaramid, Masam Gershartuing or Moyakas a Gawal could do Shachtak, as Nefida Waha, a hog a canova as an uig howl at the day valid in Krinia, as a hoglo and owl and Sahir could tall of Neheran. Harn a meal to meal a tire, as harn a meal to meal a ishke, can eat a horn a lee, a grey banah and a heron. A fehev lahash aidi. Tasha Kangli in law her day er an illaguina a hogesta clum and sahanot, an a hoilen a aulum loishok, mora will she egg a hana, agas each mad bo in a veil, e gahav a heel. Maranyan frishin, Nielsen and Norgolair, ak follows. Before we part, I think we should wholeheartedly thank the good men who raised his bones from the grave on the other side of the world and brought them here to Ireland, across thousands of miles of land and thousands of miles of sea, that they may lie in the blessed soil of Ireland awaiting the resurrection. Every person listening to me tonight in the presence of God is obliged to learn Irish immediately, if he doesn't already know it, and to keep it alive by speaking it throughout his life. If this is not done, the honour being bestowed here will all be in vain. Following the service of the previous evening, funeral mass was celebrated on Saturday morning, before the coffin was returned to the hearse and taken to the station to begin the onward journey to Dublin. Having left Cork behind, the numbers travelling to Dublin to pay their respects to a Grownie grew with every station, and a solemn excitement engulfed the train. The joy of O'Grownie's return to Ireland mixed with the grief of loss. A large crowd had gathered on the platform at Dublin's Kingsbridge station, now Houston, and a still larger crowd waited outside, 
ready to accompany O'Grownie to the pro-cathedral. The following was reported in the Independent the next day. When the train steamed into the station, the platform and approaches thereto were occupied by large numbers of admirers of the patriotic priest. As the engine slowed up, the manifestations which presented themselves on every hand forcibly brought home to the observer the conviction that all alike were of one mind in the expression of their grief for the loss of the gifted priest. On emerging from the station, the coffin was flanked by hurlers who formed a passage through the crowd with their upraised commands. The massive cortege weaved its way from the station along the quays and to the pro-cathedral, where the remains were received by the administrator of the cathedral, Father McEntee. Early the next morning, a requiem mass was held in the small chapel where the coffin rested, and as the day unfolded, crowds began to gather both inside and outside the cathedral for the main funeral mass. This next passage is taken from an article in the Freeman's Journal the following day. We question if there has ever been seen in the Irish capital such a significant procession as that which passed through the streets of Dublin yesterday behind the remains of Father O'Growney. What Father O'Growney had done for his people needed not to be said at his graveside. It was there in the long line of children and young men and women which stretched for miles behind his coffin across the city. Father O'Growney came from the people. He worked for the people and by the people he was accompanied to his last rest. Who can realise what this modest priest, without the slightest fuss or boasting, has done for Ireland and for her ancient language? It is incalculable. And how pleasant it was yesterday to find that Dublin and Ireland and the Gaelic League fully realised the debt. He deserved the best tribute his nation could give him. And it gave it to him yesterday with reverence and admiration and most deep affection. Following the funeral mass, the remains, led by members of the Atboy Hurling Club, made their way from the Pro Cathedral to Broadstone Station. Crowds followed the remains, including vast representation from branches of the Gaelic League from all parts of the country. Further crowds stood several deep along the entire route. Una Niarchila in Laura Natter Own notes that it was stated in the press that the procession was over four miles long. On Sunday, the 27th of September 1903, the remains of Antahar Ono Growney were placed on board a train for the very last leg of a journey which began in a quiet cemetery in Los Angeles. For much of the journey, Lawrence Branagh was the sole figure accompanying the remains, but by the time they were headed for Maynooth, an enormous crowd had joined the escort, and the legion waiting in Maynooth was every bit as impressive as that which travelled from the nation's capital. About 500 people travelled by the special train, including all those who were immediately connected with the funeral ceremonies. Meantime, train after train steamed into the station, and the crowds poured out in thousands to mingle with the other crowds of Kildare and Meadmen who had come across country to meet the funeral. The procession started at a quick pace, but the pace became slower as we wound up the bridge. Suddenly, we turned a sharp angle in the centre of the village leading towards the college, and we held our breath for wonder at the sight. I see it now as then. It all comes back in a flash. The long line of white robed priests, priests and acolytes marching under the Great Cross. The hurlers with lowered commands the black horses of the hearse with their nodding plumes, the Gaelic League branches, the Cleveen and Owen McNeil walking solemnly beside the coffin of their dead comrade. The whole mass of the procession had filed into the square as the students of his own college queened over the returned body of O'Growney, and the men stood with uncovered heads as the wailing chant was echoed and re-echoed in melancholy notes from the walls around. It was all inexpressibly sad and touching in its simplicity. A temporary pulpit had been erected in the grounds and we have an image here of the taken on the day so you can see the pulpit here in the, the image closest to me. And Father Sean O'Reilly, one of O'Growney's classmates at Maynooth, addressed the crowd in Irish. He recalled their time together and the fervour with which the young Mead priest undertook to instil in his peers an understanding of the importance of the Irish language and culture. He finished by noting the significance of O'Growney's return as a symbol and as a reminder of what Irish people could and needed to do to ensure their identity was not lost. 
Tom Mears and Ella Hortley in Sanobra Huskaderi. I guess a rog will shit in our mask at ash. I guess in a leaf we yoi, Sinain Austin down the Bonsalesh Hain. I guess is more Tarava than Uber the Bonsalesh. Ni Fedul and a Lucy Vehansa, Ganaven a here on a loo, does the sheen shit of the tact. Ni aid for Ferkenter at Uik, Gan Quino at a Ushlacht, I guess at a Ela, Hogshesuas a hail da year, I guess a here a hokish. By a go a cogony, a crown on the guiha. By Lotricus a knove, in the Gnaw Queen a con cura, a brustu ashrisha ed hain, I guess got five shoe, a yaus the higshe, good a base fear gail own, and gail a waris, I guess a ibrius, the conglora de, I guess an order in the heron. From start to finish, the hand of the Almighty has been at work here, bringing him back among us again and laying him finally in the place he loved most in the world and in which can be best seen the fruits of his labour. His remains cannot be here without breeding life into generations to come. One cannot look at his grave without remembering his gentility and the willingness with which he gave up his life for his God and for his country. His voice will be a whisper on the wind, the presence of his bones a fragrant reminder to follow his ways and an acknowledgement of how well he understood that to be a true Gael, one must live and work for the glory of God and the honour of Ireland. The remains were then borne by 10 young students into the college chapel and placed before the altar, the same altar before which O'Growney had knelt to take holy orders in 1889. Not surprisingly, the next day, most of the national newspapers carried an account of the arrival of the remains to Maynooth and the following is taken from the Independent. It was amidst the public pageant which typified the massed embodiment of his principles, the national perpetuation of his teachings and the strenuous advance towards his ideals that the earthly remains of Reverend Eugene O'Growney were born yesterday through Dublin towards the accomplishment of his dearest dying wish. After four years, his last desire will today be gratified when his coffin, conveyed yesterday to, to Maynooth College amidst the triumphal yet saddened parade of the Gaelic forces, which he, more than any other man, conjured into revivified life after centuries of death-like lethargy, will be laid to rest in the quiet burial ground of his beloved alma mater. A striking feature of the procession was its unbounded comprehensiveness. Sturdy Gaelic leaguers, Elders, men and women in their prime, and youths were interspersed with long contingents of children, little ones just beginning to list the elements of Irish from the O'Growney textbooks. Young and old seemed to be drawn from all classes and conditions of town and country life. It was a popular procession, the like of which in extent, organisation and earnestness has rarely paid posthumous honour to an exiled countryman. Monday, the 28th of September, 1903, the chief mourners, a small delegation from the Gaelic League, all the college professors and numerous clergy gathered again in the college chapel for the Requiem Mass. On exiting the chapel, there was a noticeable contrast between the frenzied excitement of the public events since the arrival of the remains into Cove and the private solemn ritual of the Maynooth funeral. A grave had been dug in the college graveyard for a grounding, but this was not to be his final resting place. But just as the clay was turned, there came word to Maynooth and to the Gaelic League that Irish America would not have it so, but rather that the casket containing the remains should remain in the sight of New Ireland. At Maynooth they fell in with the idea, offering the basement of the church tower as a place of temporary interment, and those of the Gaelic League connected with the funeral arrangements at once saw the fitness of the suggestion. It was finally decided that a little oratory would be a fitting resting place, in which the coffin would remain visible through glass panels in the doorway or through little window openings. Dr Mannix immediately offered the free plot inside the gate of the graveyard to the right and plans were drawn up for the chapel by Mr William Alphonsus Scott, architect of the church which was then under construction in Anspidale. Having been exhumed on the 2nd of September 1903, O'Growney's remains were not finally interred until Tuesday the 28th of February 1905, after a last quiet funeral mass. In this image, we can see the remains coming through the graveyard entrance on the right. So as you look at it on the right and on the left, we can just make out the corner of the oratory. And this then is the oratory itself. <laughs>
The following lines are taken from a short article that same year published in the Record of the League of St. Columba, a journal produced annually by the Student Irish Language Society, which would become Irish Lower Wanud in 1907. A tall shay in our mask at east, on Sagart Quave Canasta, a yen a hail ye brewer son the heron, agas her son, a treadiv. Er noctula fichia de vi fauda, dash ye o gopri vodake, gorillig and closhta, gadia hossa, zainak. A sanchina hosh in a leonish go cun suckers, ak kego will and sangish and balov agas and lovish and gun curry, sprag and shay agas grease and shishin con ibera, co darafa agas co boon, a samoksha bill in our vochit. He is among us again, the gentle, kind priest who sacrificed his life for Ireland and for her faith. On the 28th of February, he was privately moved to the college graveyard to his final resting place. This is where he now lies, quiet, at peace. And though his tongue is mute and his hand lifeless, he encourages and inspires us to work as positively and as solidly as if he were alive amongst us. O'Growney had been dead for over five years by this time, having died on the 18th of October 1899. And while his death had certainly impacted on his fellow countrymen, it was his repatriation that captured the hearts and minds of both the Irish in America and the Irish at home. The idea of an Irishman lying in a foreign grave against his wishes struck a chord with many of the Irish in America, exiles themselves who understood what it was to be removed from their homeland. Thus, when Brannock made the call to bring home the remains of this most Irish of sons, his call was readily answered. As the remains travelled from the west coast of America through the Midwest and to the east coast, the momentum increased. The growing crowds at each funeral were reminded continuously of their heritage, of their sense of identity, of the importance and the significance of what it was to be Irish. They were reminded of the struggles and the losses their homeland had endured, of what had been taken from them. O'Growney was exactly the leader that the Irish movement needed. A man unfamiliar with the language, who took it upon himself to learn it, to love it and to share it, who became consumed by it and by the need to preserve it. He realised that Irish was not just a language, but a repository of Irishness, through which Irish people could once again feel a sense of belonging. And Tahir Ono Growney's final journey was a long one, from the west coast of America to Maynooth, but it was a remarkable journey. Ten funerals in all were said for the soul of the young priest from Ballyfallon, and each of these funerals was preceded by prayer services and the offices of the dead. The first funeral took place in Los Angeles on his death in 1899. The second also in Los Angeles after his remains were exhumed in 1903. The third in San Francisco, the fourth in Chicago, the fifth in New York, the sixth in Cove, the seventh in Dublin, the eighth in Maynooth, the public funeral on the evening of the arrival of the remains, the ninth in Maynooth, the private ceremony the morning after, and the tenth in Maynooth in 1905, after which he was finally laid to rest. The outpouring of emotion on each leg of his final journey was not just about sorrow for the young priest's death, but was also about realisation and hope. For Irish exiles, it was an opportunity to mourn for the loss of their homeland and those they left behind. And for many, it was an acceptance of their own reality, that unlike O'Growney, they would not return home and would not be buried in Irish soil. But for Irish everywhere, O'Growney had come to symbolise Irishness, and on his death, they were reminded of what he stood for, what he strived for, and they were reminded that true, true Irishness was within every Irish person who was responsible for ensuring that Ireland's uniqueness would survive and be passed on. And I'll finish up with an excerpt from an article written by Patrick O'Quigley in on Clive Sullish on November the 26th, 1899. Ireland has found another martyr in one who had been in our midst here in America for the past three years. One whose name is a byword in every Irish home. One whose name and fame and worth will live in ages yet to come, the late Father O'Growney, one of the best and truest of all the true sons of Aidan, whose noble life and brilliant intellect were unstintingly given to the cause which he loved with all the ardour of his pure soul, the cause which all thinking Irishmen hold and cherish so earnestly, the revival of the Irish language. His deeds live after him. His work is imperishable. He has revived the Irish language and in that has immortalised himself 
And so his name shall be held in benediction by generations of Irish men yet to come, who shall hymn in loving Gaelic accents the name of him who placed a mellifluous tongue in a healthful state of preservation and beyond and above the reach of its foes to harm. True, he shall walk no more visibly amongst us, but he will continue in our midst by his books, his writings and the forcible example of his entire life, and above all, in that tongue he taught, he taught us to love and speak. His deeds shall live, and his name will remain inseparably enshrined in Irish song and story, and in the hearts of our ever grateful people. So long as the son or daughter of Aaron remains on earth, so long shall the imperishable name of Father O'Grownley be held in loving and living remembrance. He has elevated the Irish character, he has set us to thinking and studying our country's history, has made of the Irish race better men and better women by teaching us throughout his entire memorable life to cling unswervingly to the national customs and traditions of our glorious country and tongue. Thank you very much indeed. It was a wonderful lecture. It was so comprehensive and uh, it inspires a great many thoughts. I mean, for one thing, the great unity that uh, was among the Irish, not only in Ireland, but also with the Irish diaspora. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, above, well, also, of course, it shows um, how, ide how idealistic the people were. And I, I think it gives a great insight into uh, something which um, is amazing when you think back to that period of revival, because it was a revival in every aspect of life, in every aspect of social life. One can see in your account there of the affection people had for this one man yeah. and how he inspired uh, so much respect and affection. Uh, one can see a little bit better the spirit which animated uh, that revival in, the, in that period, and it's so it's no wonder that it did lead to all sorts of wonderful things uh, which yeah. we're which we're commemorating at the moment. Anyway, I'm sure that if yeah, and I just say uh, to to respond to that, I think one of the most remarkable things is that so few people knew who he was <laughs> until he died. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, those that were attending coloured away, the classes became familiar, as you mentioned yourself at the start, with the simple lessons, and he was a regular writer in newspapers. <laughs> but at the same time, he wasn't a, a person who was noticed. It wasn't a name that people, that, that people recognised. It was just something that he captured. He captured an essence, and he became a symbol for something. Mm -hmm. And I think it was just this idea that here was a man, and, I, and I, 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 you probably noticed in a lot of the contemporary accounts that people kept saying how he gave up his life for Ireland and the Irish language, because it, people genuinely believed that he worked so hard for the language. And at one stage, I mentioned the year 1891, which was a very important year in his life, because he, he took on so many different roles, including the chair of Irish and Minutes, which on its own would be enough for any person. But he was also editor of Irish Lower de Gaike. He was involved in Conor de Gaike. He, was, he, wasn't, uh, at, he wasn't present at the very first meeting when Conor de Gaike was founded, but he had been involved in the initial talks and he ended up being vice president. So he was very much involved it, he put his energy completely and, and fully into the Irish language. So people felt then that this be, came ahead of his health and that his health suffered because he spent so much time on it. And this is why we keep hearing these constant uh, remarks about him giving up his life for the, the language and the country that he loved. But really, I think with Ono Granny, it's the spirit. It's what, it, it's this quiet figure, this unassuming person who just believed in, he, he, and as I said, well, Interestingly, his clerical studies came second, which in a lot of cases at the time, clerical studies would have been first, and then maybe the language or, or cultural studies would have come second. But he very much, and everybody recognised it when he was sent to, to Mullingar and subsequently to Ballinacarrigy, that he actually wasn't very good as a priest. He wasn't good in the, the missionary sense and or administering to, to his people. All he wanted to do was write letters. He spent most of that time in Ballinacarrigy writing to Douglas Hyde, among others. And that's not by any way a slant on the man, but it shows just when he really believed in the language and he felt that this was something he could do. Because remember again what we said at the start, he didn't have Irish himself, he learned it at a later stage, and he went into Maynooth at a time when there was no energy, there was no interest in the Irish language. The chair hadn't been filled 
for uh, 16 years before he was appointed. And prior to that, there were Irish classes, but it was a student, it was usually a postgraduate student who happened to be interested in Irish, who would have given these classes. And at a stage, it was required, but then the requirement was removed. It kind of became the case of, well, you can get an exemption, and every second person got an exemption. So the classes were very small. So it was up to the likes of O'Brien. When he was a student, he set up Buinta in the Gaelic. And we talk about Buinta in the Gaelic quite a lot when we talk about the story of Irish and Muslim. But Buinta means it's basically a grouping. So he just set up these groups because he, he, this, he encountered speakers from different parts of the country for the first time when he went to Maynooth. He encountered these native speakers from different areas and he wanted to learn the dialect. So he just had this idea. But well, why don't we, with these vast grounds in Maynooth, we regularly go for walks. So why don't we walk Askwaike? And he nominated one of the students, we say a native speaker, possibly from Donegal, depending on, on whichever student it was. And that person was known as the Moshter. And there would have been three or four students interested in Irish who maybe wouldn't have had very much Irish or were only attending the early classes. And they would walk together and they'd speak Askwaike together. And it was a very simple thing in some ways, but it had such an impact because more and more students started to join in. And the Irish Language Society in Minut it was set up in 1898 and it's still to the go to this day. O'Brien set one up two years prior in 18, no, not two years prior, He'd set one up prior, I'm trying to think of the year off the top of my head, I can't think, but he had set up an initial a society that didn't work. But others saw what his society had tried to do, and they established it. And as I say, Kula Kulinkila to this day is still, we celebrated 120 years in 2018. So that has all come from a groundy still. And a lot of the uh, Irish Hour, well, Noon I mentioned, came from a student. The, the record of the League of St. Columba, that was a student publication. So Brownie lit a fire in Minut that hadn't, didn't exist. The authorities had no interest. They were kind of going, okay, here's a student that will teach you, that will keep you quiet. And suddenly he had Ono Brownie, and suddenly he was in the chair. He was followed by Michal Ohiki, and it was a huge scandal. He ended up being fired. And then you had strong people in latter years, like Donako Flynn and Padraig O'Finnacht in more recent times. So the chair has remained strong since Ono Brownie. So he really did more than an awful lot of people ever realised. And a lot of this didn't become known until after his death. And that's uh, Una Niarkula that I've mentioned many times in the talk. I, I, it, this book is actually, it's impossible to come by, so if any of you have it, keep it, and keep it very safe. It's a Laura and at her own. It's been out of print for many, many years. And I had a photocopy of it until a very good friend recently found a copy, and it belonged to a, a, an old student. It was in a box in Maynooth, and just happened to come across it and knew that it would go to a good home. But the thing about Una Niarkula, she was one of those people that I mentioned that was on the tender that went out to meet the boat. So her account is a fascinating account. And she spoke to people that were in his class. She spoke to people who attended the funeral. So she got this unbelievable insight. And um, it's her that tells his entire story. There's little bits that we've added in over the years that we've discovered in Maynooth. But really and truly, she has given to us this, the, the present that is the legacy of Ono Browning. And well, I need to stop talking a little bit. And you would say, I suppose, that he became a symbol for Absolutely. a spirit yeah. which inspired people. In regard to you know, the revival period and how it affected all aspects of life, it struck me that um, even in the religious sphere, if you like, because uh, the, uh, we heard about it recently, that the pilgrimage to Croke Patrick, obviously that's very ancient, but by the time of you know, the late 19th century after the Great Famine, etc., it, it was just a local uh, pilgrimage. The Mayo people locally uh, obviously kept it up all the time. But it, there was an effort made from 1903 on uh, to revive a national pilgrimage very successfully. Uh, so, so there was no aspect of life which, wa which wasn't um, inspired by this spirit. Anyway, I was going to say if people have any questions to ask you, Tracy, or, or comments to make, they're welcome to do so, I'm sure. I was just re remarking on the um, the fact there's no Irish around at the time. My grandmother went to school outside that boy, a little school called Cloran on the West Mead side. And that Farley would remember her. Uh, she would have been educated um, in the born in 1900, born actually on the 18th of October 1909, so 10 years after that man died. Uh, 
she was very fluent in Irish because the two teachers she had in that primary school were very active in the um, fight for freedom at the time when were Kathleen Farrell and Frank Flynn was their name. were sisters called Flynn's and they were teaching Irish under the radar. Um, school was, she went to school around that 1916 period um, when we were still in the, in the empire, so to speak. <laughs> and uh, um, she was, my father of course, when he was going to school, she was, she was very well able to help him with Irish homework because she was, <laughs> she was for, for a woman of her era, she was quite fluent in Irish. Yeah, I know Owen O'Browney himself, he wrote a very interesting paper uh, called The National Language and it was published in the Irish Ecclesiastical Record and he pointed out the fact that there were teachers throughout the country that were giving extra Irish classes that were prepared to teach Irish and it wasn't in certain schools the teaching of Irish was allowed but it had to be done outside of hours and he makes the comment what child is going to stay on in school to do a subject after they're supposed to go home so he had he had a great belief in teachers and he always felt that teachers and schools were the way in which the language could be preserved and could be nurtured now we may argue differently when we look back now when we talk about the education system but certainly it played a huge role and teachers like that who taught unofficially really did create because and you have to remember as well what O'Brien did himself he provided a textbook for these teachers, for these unofficial schools. And they and I don't know if any of you want to have a look at it, please do, because it's it's uh, it's the third edition of the, the first of the simple lessons. And they are just that. They begin with little pictures and little sounds and how you pronounce your words and then it builds on the vocabulary very, very simply because O'Granny himself learned it that way. But he he always kind of felt it, it, well, I shouldn't say he always felt because I didn't know the man, but you get the impression that he always felt that he missed out on an opportunity because he was so much older when he came across the language and he didn't believe the language existed. And that's why he focused so much on the schools as being the opportunity to teach children when they were young, to get them to, to learn the language, to instill in them the belief in the importance of the language. And he was quite modern in his thinking too because he never advocated that English be left aside. There were some, you know, in the Irish language movement that were very much calling for Irish, Irish only, let's get rid of English. He never looked for that. Mm -hmm. He saw no reason whatsoever why we couldn't have both. He saw no reason why you couldn't have English and that you couldn't speak Irish at the same time. So it wasn't monolingualism. He believed in bilingualism before people ever really talked that much about the importance of it. And as I say, within the language movement, it was quite unique where most were saying we need to give Ireland back to the Irish and speak the Irish language and, and get rid of this sox verla. Whereas he was actually saying, no, there's a place for both. Let's just have Irish and let's not forget who, we're, who we are and what's in our language. Because uh, like I say, he had to, to find it by accident. And he poured through every book that you could possibly find. He found neighbors in the area and I mentioned uh, mm -hmm. Nanny Sheehan's as one of them, but there were others. Michael McKenna became a great friend of his and traveled down to Cove as well to meet the remains returning home. So there were people, when he started looking, he found people. And I mentioned that early on, that they were kind of going, you know, is that fellow right in the head almost, that he's interested in learning this language? Because they were ashamed of it. They were trying to hide the fact that they had Irish. And suddenly he had this young man going, what are you hiding? Let's do something about it. And he did. He did a remarkable amount from a very quiet position. Uh, and I'd say he never thought for one second that he would become the symbol that he became such a quiet, quiet man. And that's what makes him so likable. Mm -hmm. It really is what his appeal is. It's that he never did anything for a cause per se, other than the, the cause of, of country and language. But you know, it wasn't for his own fame. It wasn't to put his own name anywhere. He never had any interest in that. He just worked away behind the scenes, kept going, kept inspiring people. And it resulted in what we, we mentioned there, a journey home that had thousands of people uh, present to, to pay their respects to him. I, um, I suppose I'm a product of Owen O'Grawley. My grandfather was probably at his funeral in Dublin. He was in, an early member of the Gaelic League. And uh, Tyre Padre Olera was in the Keating, Keating branch of Cullen uh, the Gaelic at the time. But 
my, and my grandfather was, ended up teaching in Drada. But uh, he, my father, swore by Antahar of Gromne. And I didn't realize he had died so many years before because I heard about him all through my youth yes. and onwards, you know? <laughs> so, sorry, I'm getting emotional now. Mm. Because my, but he was very much part of the fact that I grew up speaking Irish. Yeah. I'm a product of compulsory English when I went to school actually. Yeah. Early. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it was Dublin, the Dorothy bit. <laughs> <laughs> we, we forgive you that one. <laughs> but it is, it's a remarkable connection to have. Yeah. Mm. And connections like that, when you look at the branches and the members of some of those branches of Colour mm. Nagaike, now I know you know, things have changed and the, the mindset towards the church and some people, each, everybody to their own. But when you look at what Manute did, and not the authorities, I'm not talking about the authorities, I'm talking about Padre O'Leary studied in Manute, Ono Brownie studied in Manute. You had these great people, these young men, these young minds who were brought from all over the country, who were, the idea being that, it's quite funny really, because the, the authorities tried to quash any sense of nationalism among the students. But in actual fact, they locked them up together for hours at a time. And these young men exchanged ideas. It became this great industrial setting in terms of, of nationalism and, and sense of belonging. And what you see then is what was happening when these young men were ordained. They were being sent back out to every part of the country. And they were spreading what they had learned in Maynooth. And they, they realised as well, and any of you that do know the Irish language well, you know that we say spirituality in the Irish language and even prayers and everything are very different than what they are in English because they are based in spirituality and connections with nature and all those sorts of things. So the, the living spirituality has always been in the Irish language. So Irish priests, as in priests of the Irish language, they went out you know, preaching to uh, an audience that really appreciated and understood what the language meant and what was held in the language. But Padre O'Leary is a, another, I'm a great fan of Padre O'Leary's as well, but he's a, just like Ono Brownie, he was well known as not being a good parish priest, that all he ever wanted to do was write about the Irish language, and he had correspondences with people all over the country as well, and that's what, what he spent his time doing. Don't ask him to, to do a duty that he shouldn't be doing, but ask him to, to cut a ribbon for an Irish language fetch, and he'd be there and he'd write a report on it. But it wasn't in any way disrespectful of, his, of uh, his clerical duties. It was just a pure passion for the language and for the community that built up around all those branches of Conor and Aguilia and those connections, as I say, are invaluable. Tracy, there's a cup of tea available next door and I'm sure that people are free to... Oh, absolutely. To, to yeah. continue the conversation with I you. I don't know, Chris, if you want to fire your question. No, I was just going to make a comment that, that I was amazed and impressed at the number of Gaelic organisations and associations yeah. that you mentioned that I'd never heard of, like the Knights of Tara. Yeah. Where are they now? <laughs> It'd be an interesting question. You know, and the Knights the of dancing. Robert Emmett, I never heard of. Yeah. Was there a global organisation and these were little branches? Or? Yeah, well, what it seems to be that there was just networks of Irish society. Some of them were well aware of the ancient uh, Order of Hibernians, mm -hmm. the, the Knights of Columbus, we've heard of all those. But it just seems to be the, and we, uh, we were speaking earlier ourselves about uh, Irish people emigrating and the importance of networks and making these connections. And that's what these were. So what exactly the background of some of them is, I honestly couldn't tell you, but it'd be well worth digging into yes, to find out who exactly some of these organisations well, were. In the 1890s and so, there were about 40 Irish language newspapers our, our journals are making up newspapers exactly all over North America. There were so many of them. Lots of PhDs. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the students were the <laughs> So if you know about any students, you can be in this.